Well, hello, everybody. Dr. Bruce Foskey here from Arkansas State University in Jonesboro. And today I want to take you through some of my ideas about one of the etudes from this year's set of ASBOA Allstate etudes. Today we'll be talking about Tyrell number 16. So let's go ahead and dive in. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to walk you through where you can find out more information about this etude. So give me just one second here. I'm going to do a picture in picture here so you can still see my beautiful face and show you the website at the same time. So what we have here is asboa.org and the website, if you scroll down here on the left side, you can see here that there's links to important info. Allstate Clinic Audition Materials, Senior High Wind and Percussion, and it opens up a PDF document that you should probably download and keep on your computer because it tells you all of the information you need to know. Um, this is an older sheet, but it rotates through the three sets, so 2021 would go back to set number one. It leaves you an information about the major and minor scales for all instruments, the chromatic scales for all instruments, and the ranges. So if we scroll down here to tenor trombone, we see that these are the major scales that are two octaves, G, A, E, F, B flat, A flat, and G flat. The minor scales that are two octaves are A, E, F sharp, G sharp, G, F, and B flat, and the chromatic scale starts on F. And the one octave scales are C, D, B, E flat, and D flat. And the minor one octave scales are B, C sharp, D, C, and E flat. Bass trombone is all, it looks like they are all two octave scales. So if we scroll down through here, through the various instruments, um, you can check these this document for information for your friends as well. But if we scroll down through here for the tenor trombone list, set one, we have the Melodious Etudes. These are by, well, they're originally by Bordoni, but this book would be would say that they're by Johannes Rochu, number four and 13, with the metronome marking, quarter note equals 69 for number four, eighth note equals 72 for number 13. And then the progressive studies of the book that we're talking about today, number 16, the first 10 lines plus a quarter note, at quarter note equals 72, and number 24, quarter note equals 72. So today we're going to focus our attention on number 16. So one of the things that's important to me when we do this study is that you understand how important it is to me that you purchase the music, that you don't do the thing where you um, just borrow it from a friend. It's very, very important to me that you buy the book. Now I have a digital scan of the book, but it's a digital scan of the book that I made. And my original book is in my file cabinet at the university. And now that the university is on lockdown from COVID-19, I'm using what I have here with me. And I understand that in some cases you're going to have to do that. But if, if your budget permits and uh, your band director, uh, maybe your band director can help you find it, uh, you should grab a copy of the book. It's a reasonably priced book. Um, and I might even have a few extra copies that I might be willing to let go for less than the uh, cost of a new book, if it's that much of a budget constraint. But you should have the book, because then you don't have to constantly search for copies of the etude, and they won't get crumpled up in the back of your instrument cubby or inside your case or folded up, and and uh, you know they'll end up looking like papyrus by the end of the season. So grab the book and sit down with me, and we're going to do a uh, read-through. I'm going to give you some basic thoughts about how I would approach this etude. So the first thing you should do, number 16 on page 16, is number your measures. Now I'm gonna go through here and I'm gonna give you the measure number for the first measure of each line. And that should allow you, it should give you a shortcut to at least uh, track along with me when I'm talking about various measures. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you these and what you can do is you can pause the video in between and write them in. So obviously the first full measure is what I'm numbering as measure one. Um, the first measure of the second line is measure seven. The first measure of the third line is measure 12. The fourth line, the first measure is 17. The next line, first measure is 22. The next line, first measure is 27. Then 32, 
36, 40, 46. And then the last note, which is the first note of the last line, is measure 53. So let's talk about it. So we're dealing with five flats here. Now, um, you can talk about key centers, but I think it's important with all of these etudes. This is what I recommend that everyone does, is that you play the corresponding major and minor scales that are in five flats. So the major scale in five flats is D flat major. Play through D flat major at least at the speed of this etude. At least 72 beats a minute in an eighth, sixteenth pattern. That should be the goal. Now, uh, rhythm pattern. And then the corresponding minor scale. Now, how do we figure out the minor scale from the major scale? Well, you could look at the scale sheet, but you may not always have the scale sheet with you. And I think it's important to understand how these scales relate. Now, when they're talking about the minor scale that would be related to the major scale, that's the relative minor. That's where the name comes from. It's the relative minor because it's related. They share the same key signature. Kind of like if you have a cousin with the same last name, that you share that name. Think of the key signature, the number of sharps or flats, kind of as the family name. So five flats is D flat major, and the relative minor can be found by going up to the sixth scale degree of the major scale. D flat is one, E flat is two, F is three, G flat is four, A flat is five, B flat is six. So B flat minor is the minor scale with five flats. So if you can practice your D flat major scale and your B flat minor scale, you're going to have a great understanding of the key areas where this etude travels. You're going to have a very good understanding of both of those difficult keys, and it should make learning the etude easier. You see, most of Western music is made up of scales and arpeggios. And so if you can have a clear understanding of sort of the DNA of this music, you're going to have a much better shot of learning this etude. You probably have to write in fewer fingerings, write in fewer reminder accidentals, although you know, I don't, I'm, not a, I'm not averse to people writing things in their part. Um, in fact, I have quite a few things written in my part. But what you have written in your part is super important. So let's number the measures. Take time right now and do that. And then write down somewhere on the page that you need to look at the D-flat major and B-flat minor scales. Now, the next step after that is to go through here and define every term on the page. So we start at the very beginning. Andante maestoso, metronome marking, quarter note equals 72. Andante maestoso. Google is your friend, but I'm going to be your Google for right now because this is a demonstration video and I'm going to show you uh, how to do it every step of the way. So andante maestoso, slow with majesty. That's literally what the translation tells me when I look it up. Now, if you look underneath the first measure, next to the dynamic marking of mezzo forte, we have sempre marcato. That's fancy Italian talk right there, right? Sempre marcato. Uh, always accented. So, think about this. Let's say you practiced this thing for months and you never looked up what those terms meant. And you see all of this ink on the page, all these 16th notes. So, obviously, it must be super fast, right? Because they're 16th notes. And I don't see accents everywhere. So you see how quickly you are informing your performance by having these things written in? Be responsible for every word on every piece of music that you play. Look it up. You have your phone right there. The answers are, you know, they're literally a few keystrokes away. So if we scroll down and look through the etude here in measure 11, which is the last measure of the second line, we have a word that translates to easy. Well... I think it's kind of a, a troll move on the part of Mr. Tyrell to tell you a, a, a measure with a, a, a wide range scale is easy. But what he's telling you is that you shouldn't force it, that you should make it sound easy as best you can. He's not telling you that it is easy. He's telling you that he would like it to be played 
to where it sounds easy. And if we look further down the page, measure 34, where it says Meno Moso, you probably know that one from most of your band music, but it translates to less motion, meaning that this passage is slightly slower than 72. I would probably place it somewhere around 66. It just needs to be enough where the people who are going to be listening to you play, the judges for the room, they need to know that you know what that marking means. I'm not saying play it at 50 beats a minute, although it is kind of open-ended. You could play it that slowly, but I really think it would be best for it to be in the ballpark of 72, just slightly slower than that. So 66 is a wide enough of a range where you can make that change, and it sounds noticeable to the listener. And then if we scroll down a little bit further, more, measure 41 into 42, it looks just like the beginning. This is the recapitulation. This is the return to the original material. And it says a tempo, which means first tempo or uh, prime first original tempo. Um, so you would go back to 72 beats a minute right there all the way to the end of the cut, which is after the quarter note resolution in the first measure of the last line. So that's sort of the uh, roadmap of this thing. Beyond that, what I find is... Um, a few guide rule, guidelines that I like to uh, adhere to. Let's talk about staccato dots for just a moment. There are circles in which it's taught that staccato means short. Staccato notes are surely shorter than full value notes, but I don't like to think of them as short. I like to think of them as separated. And here's why those are, it's an important designation. When you hear short and you try to play short, you're really trying to play short. And so the, the tone gets sacrificed when we play short. If we play separated, it's still a high quality tone note with some space in between. Now, some might say, well, you know, you're, you're nitpicking. It's a, it's, a, it's a tiny detail. What's the difference between calling it short or separated? Well, I think the difference is everything. And I think the difference really comes down to um, the way that you think about the music is how you will produce the music, how you will play the music. And if you don't have a strong mental concept of what you want it to be, tone first being the most important thing, being your thumbprint or your business card for your playing, anything that you can do that jeopardizes that tone is something that needs to be talked about. And so when you go through here and you see, like in measure three, the staccato dots, and then they come back and measure seven at the beginning of the second line. And they come back and measure 14, the arpeggiated figure in the third measure of the third line. And so on and so forth. Make sure that those notes still have tone attached to them. Don't tongue them so hard that they sound more like a, a tool than a musical instrument. Take your time with it. Understand every note in the bar. Be able to play it slowly, cleanly, with standard articulation, with no staccato at all and then simply create space between the notes but maintain tone always now let's talk a little bit about this accent rooftop accent here um, in this style of music it's not really called a rooftop accent but most of you probably um, know it as that some might call this accent a martellato or a sforzando. I've heard all sorts of things. Vertical accent. So the way that I think about this type of accent, it's about weight on the note more than it is about tonguing the note really hard. Now, the tongue does have a role in this. Don't, don't get me wrong. It does have a role. But I want you to imagine for a second the Wizard of Oz and that house that landed on the Wicked Witch. Think about that weight that came down, directly down, and so these notes need to be heavy and full, and they need to be punctuated, but they need to be heavy and full. Your accent comes from bringing attention to it by the weight that you generate with that note. Da di da 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 di da 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 da. Now these accents are different, and they're sort of a normal accent, a marcato. So they're marked, meaning that they have some weight, but maybe they're a little less aggressive than the vertical accent mark. Now, the slurs in this etude, to me, 
uh, are less about slurring and more about making the notes connected. Because obviously on the trombone, we're going from a third position A flat to a second position D flat. We're moving up with the slide and we're moving up with the interval. And so we can get a nice clean slur that way. Some might feel like it would be best to put a slight bit of da on that D flat on the, the downbeat of the first full measure and each subsequent figure that looks like that. You have to try both ways to see what works best and ultimately sounds best for you. Record yourself regularly. Listen back to see if you're getting the result that you like. And if you don't like the result, be willing to change something until you get the result that you like. Now is the time to experiment. November is not the time to experiment. Really, September or October are not the time to experiment. Now when you have the free time, take the time to experiment and record yourself on some, some device. It doesn't really matter what you record yourself on. What matters is that you do record yourself and you listen back and ask yourself, am I truly satisfied with what I hear in the product that I'm making right now? So as we scroll through here and we're moving forward, I've talked about the staccato. I've talked about the vertical accent, the marcato accent, the slurs. Let's talk a little bit about um, this scale in measure 11 going to measure 12. If we start in this scale in measure 11 with a C on the downbeat, we're working all the way up to a high A flat in measure 12 on the downbeat of 12. So remember, we're dealing also with a G flat on the second to last note, the pentultimate note. We go F. G flat in sharp third to A flat in third position. Please do not play your A flats in first position. It, it will come out, but it's 40 cents flat in almost every case. Unless you're lipping the pitch up and then you're going to be sacrificing tone to get the tuner to look correct. And I don't ever want to sacrifice tone to make the needle land where it's supposed to on the tuner. Play that A flat in third position. It's counterintuitive because we're going F in first to G flat in sharp third to A flat in third. So we're going up, but we're also going slightly out with the slide. If you don't put the slide in the exact correct spot for you, I'm not telling you that it's, you know, nine and three quarter inches from first position to third. That's not what I'm talking about. If you listen to the radio in the car, and let's say that you listen to 102.7. If you put the radio on 102.5 or 102.6, you're probably going to get static. You're not dialing the radio in to the correct frequency to pick up that signal that's floating around in the air. The trombone works very much the same way. If you are sending out the correct frequency right here on the face, and you have the slide in the right spot, the instrument will resonate those vibrations very easily through the instrument. Range for most players in the upper end of the instrument is more about getting the slide in the right spot, have it, hearing the correct note in your ears, producing the correct note with the lips, and then making sure you're having the correct length of tubing for that note to resonate freely on the instrument. The players that have the most range development are the ones that figure that out. And it's usually also the players that have the most tonal development. So if you work back from range to focusing on a primary production of tone as your top priority, you're going to find that your range starts to increase as you focus on your tone production and it's sitting in the center of every single note. And you can do that in one of two ways. With the tuner, spend time with the tuner to know your tendencies on your instrument. Know what your instrument's capable of, know the adjustments that you need to make, and understand that on trombone, we have the ability to be perfectly in tune, but with great power comes great responsibility, and we also run the risk of being out of tune on every note. So it takes time to understand what your tendencies are, know where to make those adjustments and how to make those adjustments. Don't overcorrect, don't undercorrect, but know the tendency and then switch over from the tuner and try to play with a drone. Now I'm going to pull up an app that I use pretty regularly for this. I actually found the, the files in Spotify. Um, you can have different feelings about Spotify. That's not the point of this, of this video. But what I like to use here are these cello drones. And the reason I like the cello drones is because it is an actual person 
playing a cello and the tracks are uh, stretched out to six minutes. So let's say that we want to play along with a concert F. You could play an F into, a, into tonal energy, and that's great. You can even produce the tone on tonal energy that's sort of a, um, a MIDI-generated sound. But you can also go and you get perfect fifths in the key of F, and you can play along with those sounds until the beats are gone. There's no better way, in my opinion, to work on sure-footedness sure of your pitch than to play along with a human-generated tone rather than a digitally produced tone. Now, naturally, uh, if you're playing with, with a neighbor or a friend or a sibling or someone else, they have their own humanity that they're bringing to their instrument. No one's perfect. So the ability to match pitch is actually more important than the ability to peg it every time because pitch, especially in an ensemble setting or if you're playing with a piano that's been, uh, that hasn't been tuned recently, it's a moving target. And you have to have the ability to not just know where you are to get that needle in tune, but you have to know where the pitch is and wh how you're trying to fit into it. I hope that makes sense. So I'll put a link below for that information. So we move on from the scale in measure 11 to measure 12. We understand that in 13, we're dealing with an arpeggio here. We have a D flat F and an A flat, or actually A flat, D flat, F, A flat. So if you can stack those in thirds, you'll see that it is a D flat major triad. Starting on the fifth, D flat, F, A flat. The first note of that arpeggio is an A flat, followed by D flat, F, A flat. Then in measure 14, we have another arpeggio. This time I'm seeing a G flat, a B flat, an E flat. And then if we start on that E flat, it looks like it's stacked thirds. E flat, G flat, B flat. So E flat to G flat is a minor third. G flat to B flat is a major third. So we're dealing with a minor triad, an E flat minor triad. If you understand and recognize all the notes that are in the arpeggio, and you're not guessing, oh, I think that's a G. Well, it's not a G, it's a G flat. Take the time to map that out. Grab a writing utensil of some sort and just sit down without your instrument and try to map these things out so that you know what you're aiming for. Now, as we work through here, you start to see that there are going to be opportunities to use alternate positions. Um, and my take on alternate positions is that you shouldn't go out of your way to use them. But you, if it makes playing more convenient, it makes the slide technique more elegant and easy, then you should consider it. You should try all options and find out what works best for you. So as we sort of look through here a little bit, there's a couple of measures that I really want to talk about the use of some alternates that are helpful. In particular, measure 19. If we look at measure 19, beat 2 and beat 3, we have beat 1, C, D flat, C, A, F, G flat. And then I would think about playing that F on the downbeat of 3 in 6th position. The reason is um, it's much easier to go from G flat in 5th to F in 6th than go G flat in 5th to F in 1st and then move the slide back out again. Now, granted, we are moving from 6th position F to 3rd position E flat. And it's 6 and 1 half a dozen another. But you, to me, I find that the technique is much easier that way. And then if you look at the recommended positions that happen in measure 20 and 21, um, I'm not sure that I would follow that on the E natural going to the F. And at the end of 20 going into 21, I would play that E in 2nd and the F in 1st. And then... The F that's in beat on beat two in measure 21, I would actually play that in sixth because you can stay in sixth for the low F and catch all of those notes going up to the B flat and the downbeat of 22. Now, 23 going into 24 is a little bit of a bear because we're dealing with half steps and whole steps in sort of rapid rotation. So you want to make sure that these G flats in 23 beat 1 and 20 and beat 2 of 24 
that it's clearly a G flat and you're not cutting off any of the length because of the rapid movement back and forth. Practice these passages slowly. Really stick the landing on those G flats. Land right on 102.7, not 102.6. If you put the trombone in the, in the correct spot, it will resonate in tune. And it also makes what happens in beat three of 24 more powerful. Because if you see, beats one and two sort of behave in the old key. But beat three, the G flat is replaced with the G natural. And there's an A natural. Ba, 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 ba. And we have a cadential movement from F to B flat. It cadences in the key of B flat major for just a moment. So if you understand what's happening with the music, you start to understand why it's so important to map these things out ahead of time and be aware of everything that's happening in the music. Now, if we look for more alternate positions here, this is sort of a, 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 a difficult passage, but it can be made easier with a few choice alternates. Uh, you play the C in third, going into measure 26th, the D flat in second, the D flat in second, a flat in third and catch the F in sixth so that you can come in to catch the D flat in fifth. I play the next F in sixth, the E flat in third, the D flat in fifth, the C at the downbeat of 27 in sixth. And then we repeat the pattern on a different note set, which is called, this is a sequence. We're doing very much the same sort of thing, just starting on a different pitch in measure 28. I would play the, the C at the end of the 16th note triplet in 6th, the G flat in 5th, the F in 6th, the E flat in 3rd, D flat in 5th, then standard positions, standard positions, and then measure 33, right before the main omoso, I would play those in standard positions as well. I wouldn't play the 5, 6, 7, 6. I'm not a, not a big fan of that particular subset. And incidentally, you're going to be behind a curtain. So um, if they were going to judge you on the position choices that you made, you're probably doing something to take them out of the musical moment anyway. So if you're using positions that allow you to play with the most comfort and ease and confidence, then the ultimate goal here is to just put them in a place where they can enjoy listening to you play. And if someone's in a position of enjoying listening to you play, they're less likely to be, be critical of the uh, position choices you make because one, you're going to have gone through it carefully and slowly with a fine tooth comb to make sure that the pitch is great on every note. And if the pitch is great on every note and the slide technique is effortless and easy, then there's not going to be any red flags for them to be listening for. They can just sit back and enjoy the performance. So when we get to this Meno Moso in 34, uh, I frankly, if 72 is the performance tempo, I would take 72, cut it in half and add 10 back. And that would be my starting tempo for this Mano Moso section. And I'm looking here to see if there's any accidentals to concern ourselves with. I don't really see anything until 35. Um, same deal as before. C, B, C, A, F, G flat on beat two of 35, the last 16th note, play the F in sixth. And then in 36, uh, standard positions, but be careful here. We have a half step motion, B, B flat, A, B flat, C can be played in sixth or the trigger. You're going to have to, um, one of the things that's uh, important to remember is that if you can break up your motion so that you're not making wide position shifts and a valve movement at the same time, B flat, A, B flat, C, to release the trigger and go to sixth position, that's an extra thing that you have to coordinate. If you play the C in sixth on the end of beat one, you can um, you only have to worry about moving the slide. It is a wide position shift, but you've probably played the B flat to C position shift a few times. Make sure that you play on beat two, D flat, C, D flat. That half step motion is still there. And then the half step motion carries through on beat three. The accidental carries through. E natural, F, E, F. G flat. Now in this bar with the sixth and the line, I would ignore that for the first portion of the beat. Play the F in first, the C in third, um, and then you have your choice of playing everything on the trigger, F, C, F, or ba 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 ba, 
one, three, six, 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 and then catch the, the positions all the way back up. 38 is very much like 36th. Uh, just be careful with where you put the slide and make sure that all accidentals are accounted for. And then it's very, very important in 40 and 41. I actually put a little bit of a retardando in 41. Da, 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 Da -dim -ba -dum. That way we're setting up the odd tempo a little bit. It's not in the music, and there might be some out there who disagree with me on that, but frankly, it's a stronger musical statement. And again, what is the point of this? We're trying to make music with this etude. And then 41 to the end is very, very much like the beginning. Um, I would say that you want, even though it's not a natural ending in measure 53, you want to try to create as much of a natural ending as possible. Practice it as if it's the end, as if that's where the etude ended. Um, it's very easy to sort of treat that like you're getting cut off in the middle of a phrase, but I think you can set it up and really make it sound like a nice ending. It's not the strongest cadence, but it is a cadence. And so you have the opportunity to sort of set that up. And you can choose to do that with a little bit of a retardando, or you can play right through. The most important thing here is that you make an educated decision. Ask your teachers what they think you should do and then sell it, sell the decision. Don't play it in a way that makes you wonder or makes anyone else wonder if you're not sure about what you want to do. Well, this is my first attempt at doing something like this. And I'm working out the video editing and I'm working out the punching in of the the short screenshots of the actual sheet music. I didn't take the time to annotate, but I tried to be as clear about the measures that I was talking about as I could be, um, you know, when I would when I would recall them by name. I hope that you found some value in this, and if you did, I would really appreciate you reaching out and letting me know. Not so much to stroke my ego or anything, but just to let me know if. Uh, you found this helpful, if you found this beneficial for you or your students, if you'd like more of this kind of thing, you know, philosophically, I have kind of an issue with just uh, playing it down and putting it up on YouTube, mainly because I think that I can teach more by explaining these things and breaking them down bit by bit and talking about the important points so that you can then take them away and chew on them for a while and then come and play them for me. And then we can certainly go back and forth and play. But if I give you the etude performance right now. So what's the old adage? You give someone a fish and they eat for that day. But you teach them to fish and they eat for a lifetime. I want to give you the skills so that you can go into the practice room and apply this sort of scalpel-like approach to all four of the all-region etudes. All four of them. You can break them down with this sort of approach, breaking it down by key and style and knowing all the terms. Take the time to do this. I know it seems like a lot up front. I know it seems like I'm the most micromanaging person on the planet, but I promise you, if you can start to look at your music this way, it's gonna be revolutionary for your practice. It will make all the difference in the world. Now I can go through and I can add some short clips of me playing particular passages, but I think I'd like to, to reserve that for when we're doing one-on-one -on -one work. Um, so if you found value in this and you'd like to learn more or you'd like some help, um, what I would recommend is take a couple weeks and do the things that I recommend in the last half hour and then come and talk to me. Let's find a time to get together. I have nothing but time right now and you probably have nothing but time right now. So this is a perfect opportunity to get a jump start on next year. So if I can be of help, please let me know and I look forward to hearing from you. Take care. <music>